Good evening. Tonight I bring you a pretty chilling encounter with what the writer describes to be his father's terrifying experience with the skinwalker. I apologise for my absence, but I want to thank you all for helping me pass 2,000 subscribers. So without further ado, let's begin. It was the late June of 1968. My dad was 12. My grandparents had moved a few months earlier from Tucson, Arizona to Concho, Arizona. Concho was vastly different that Tucson both in landscape and temperature. Sitting at 5,000 feet above sea level, the summer temperatures were around 70 degrees in comparison to the 100s in summertime Tucson. Resting at the edge of the White Mountains, the land is red, yellow and brown sandstone cliffs and buttes against the larger ancient basalt flow ridge that lines the north from the Springville Volcanic Range. Concho, well, Old Concho as it's referred to now, sits among the high altitude desert, with large basalt ridge bordering the east and north. In the valley and dry riverbed was dotted by large groves of cottonwood trees. The buttes and ridges boasted large twisted juniper and cedar trees. Only about 200 people lived in Concho at that time. It's in pretty close proximity to the petrified forest, so petrified wood was plentiful on the valley floor. There were also numerous ancient Anasazi ruins scattered along the valley. My great uncle had moved his family to Concho as well. My grandpa had recently finished his civil engineering degree and he and my great uncle were doing highway construction all around the White Mountains. They had both purchased land in the Concho area for pretty cheap. My great uncle had two sons who were a year older and a year younger than my dad, Tony and Zach. Tony was 13 and Zach was 11. My dad and his cousins were inseparable. They would spend their days exploring the surrounding landscape, accompanied by my dad's American bulldog, Sarge. They had found quite a few ruins, numerous pictographs and some old abandoned abode homesteads probably from the late 19th century. Every morning, weather permitting, they would load up their bags with canteens, bologna sandwiches and head out into the wilderness to play and explore. My grandparents and great aunt and uncle's rules was for the children to return by sunset. As my dad recalls, on one particular summer morning, they had hiked west towards the edge of the giant basalt ridge to explore. After going for about a mile or so, they came upon a ario running adjacent to the ridge. Large black boulders and giant slabs of sandstone peppered the wash. The banks were pretty steep but they would have to cross it if they want to explore the ridge on the other side. They made their way down slowly. Once in Ario, they realised that the opposite bank was too steep to climb, so they started following it west to find a better place to climb up. My dad said as soon as they got into the riverbed, he started getting an unnerving feeling like they were being watched. He said it was extremely quiet, no birds or circads chirping. It was hot as well, no breeze stirred the air. The further they walked down the wash, the more a sense of urgency began to build in his gut. He didn't say anything though, for fear that his cousins would laugh at him. About a half mile or so down the wash, it made a bend around a large volcanic boulder. Suddenly Sarge began a low growl. Here standing up in his back, this startled all three of the kids. Looking around, they didn't see anything. So encouraging the dog, they moved closer to the bend. Sarge, well, he stayed rooted to the spot, growling and snarling and barking. All three of the boys began to get scared. They agreed that maybe they should just turn around. They noticed that there was a spot where they could climb out of the wash. They hadn't noticed it at first but it looked almost like a game trail. Adrenaline fueling them, they hauled ass up the side of the embankment towards the ridge, the dog darting after them. The whole time the bad feeling was growing stronger with my dad. 
Breathless, they stopped at the top to catch their breath. Sitting against a large boulder, they took some drinks from the canteen and assured each other that Sarge probably smelled a coyote or spotted a rabbit. Here, the game trail was more apparent, had even worn into some of the volcanic and sandstone that protruded from the ground. Intrigued, they decided to follow it. They decided to follow it as a ways to find a shady spot to eat lunch. They noticed that there was a lot of petroglyphs dotting the black rocks. Geometric shapes, animal, human figures, there were so many. Finally, they found a large juniper with a gnarled trunk and ate their lunch in shade. Bellies full and excitement replacing fear, they hurried along the trail as it slowly zigged and zagged the side of the basalt ridge, avoiding large areas of rock falls. The pictographs began to change as well along the trail, lots of spirals and horned looking men. My dad even said there was one that looked like a UFO. Turning around a bend, the trail suddenly disappeared. Only one space of the edge of the cliff. There was nowhere else to go. Cliff drop off to one side and a sheer cliff going up about 50 feet on the other. My dad, he was disappointed but also a little relieved as the sun was getting further west and we're pretty far from Concho now. They could see the town in the distance, as well as a Zuni Holly mountain and mesas that dotted the distant Navajo reservation. Although they were disappointed, they decided that it was worth looking at the view. They started making their way down the trail when they spotted an opening in the cliffside, a side canyon, they hadn't noticed on the way up. It was behind a large twisted cedar, the tree shadow had hidden it. It looked almost like there was another trail going into the divide. The opening was only about four feet wide. Looking at it, the unnerving feeling returned to my dad. His stomach dropped and he felt like it was twisting in knots. The hair on the back neck stood up. Tony suggested that they should detour and check it out. My dad protested, saying that they needed to get back. Zach, well, he stayed silent. He looked as frightened as my dad felt. Tony laughed when looking at them and called them both sissies. He said if they didn't want to go, fine. They could wait there for him and be babies if they wanted to. Sarge had run down the trail and was out of sight. My dad whistled for him, but he didn't return. Zach decided he'd follow Tony. So my dad stayed behind while they entered the narrow black walled canyon. When they moved out my dad's field of vision, the wind picked up, whooshing through the canyon and trees making a creepy sound. It was quiet except the wind, and my dad thought he had heard faint voices on the air. He shivered, the ominous feeling growing stronger. Ten minutes passed, then twenty, and still Tony and Zack had not returned. A large cloud had covered the sun and drops of rain began to fall. My dad moved under the cedar to get out of the light rain that began to fall. He sat on a rock and began to shiver. Suddenly, something grabbed his shoulder. He jumped up about three feet and screamed. He heard laughter. It was Tony and Zack. They looked extremely excited. Look, you'll never believe what we found, they exclaimed, almost breathless. We found some Indian steps and they lead to a cave. They begged my dad to come see it. It wasn't far only about 10 minutes into the canyon. My dad followed reluctantly, knowing they weren't going to agree to go home until they showed him. Plus, he felt a little braver and more intrigued now. Sure enough, around a bend and about 20 yards into the canyon, the canyon was wider here, about 20 to 30 feet across, and there were indeed foot and handholds carved into the rock wall. My dad had seen steps like them before, when his parents had taken him to Chaco Canyon National Park. They were smaller than the ones in Chaco and only went up about 20 feet to the darkened mouth of the small cave. He shivered, either from excitement or fear, he wasn't quite sure. From the bottom of the canyon, there was no way of telling how large the cave was. They dropped their packs and decided to use the foot and handholds to climb up to the cave, against my dad's better judgement. The rain had stopped but they slowly and carefully made their way because the rock had become slick. 
It took about 10 minutes to ascend. My dad called for Sarge from the top again, but the dog still hadn't returned. The cave was much larger and deeper than they expected, and the entrance was decorated with hundreds of petroglyphs. The light didn't penetrate very far in, but they could see light in the distance from an opening in the roof, so they entered. Light adjusting to the dark, they started to notice that the ground was covered with objects. What looked like rocks and debris now revealed itself to be pots. Beautifully painted pots of all shapes and sizes. Black on white, painted with geometric patterns. And animals, red pots, and even more yellow ones. Large corrugated pots holding dried corn and crusty squash and beans. There were also pots filled with arrowheads and beets drums and flutes. They didn't touch anything and kept walking deeper into the cave. They looked around in shock and in awe. They had just discovered something big, something very, very big. They moved hurriedly now towards the second bit of light streaming in from the crack on the roof. The cave was littered with all sorts of artifacts, materials, stone axes, pots of all shapes, colours and sizes. They felt as though they had just discovered King Toot's tomb as they passed under the crack. They noticed that there were objects in alcoves in the wall. My dad moved closer to one and his blood froze. He was looking at a human body. It was decayed skin and hair clinging to patches and its mouth open in what looked like a silent scream. He leaped back. Tony and Zack also froze. The walls were lined with alcoves filled with ornately dressed bodies, lining the walls as far as they could see in the darkness. Suddenly an ominous and horrendous penetrating screech broke the silence of the cave. All three boys jumped and my dad looked in the direction from where the sound came from and saw two red and glowing eyes. He froze, locked in place by the glowing red eyes. Suddenly the cave was washed over with a stench of decay and death. The eyes began to move towards the boys, slowly. Another hideous growl and screech jolted them from being petrified in place. The eyes were moving fast now right towards them, and they heard thudding of running footfall. They turned and tore out of the cave as fast as they could. They ran as fast as their legs could carry them in a blind panic. The entrance to the cave was maybe 30 yards away. My dad looked back against his better judgement and saw a man on all fours or giant coyote. He hadn't been sure. Streak across the light in the back of the cave, its red eyes not blinking. He pushed himself faster, screaming for the others to also run faster. They reached the edge of the cave, having turned around to scrabble back down the foot and handholds. Zag got there first and began descending as fast as he could. Tony was next. His face a wash of horror as he went down the face. My dad's heart was hammering into his brain by now. He turned and saw his eyes only about 20 feet from him. The stench of decay was overpowering. It made his stomach turn. Fast as he could place his feet in the first set of footholds and started clambering down the rock face. He could hear the creatures breathe now, and even feel it. Oh shit, it was at the edge. He refused to look up, trying to concentrate on his hand and footholds. He heard Tony scream from below him and looked to see Tony lose his hold and slip about five feet from the bottom. He landed on his side and began to howl with pain. My dad slowed himself a bit, still not daring to look up. After what seemed like an eternity, his leaped from the cliffside down to the last two feet. Zack was helping Tony to his feet, and Tony was frozen looking at the cave and ancient staircase. All the colour gone from his face. My dad... He was in full panic and not looking, grabbed Tony, helped Zack drag him away. They flew down the little canyon, finally before they passed the turn. My dad looked back to see the red eyes watching them from the darkness. Another howl screech rang from the cave and at that moment, Sergeant and a full run came from around the bend, growling and barking. He ran to the foot and handhold staircase and bellowed up that cave, the hair on his back standing straight up. Snarling and growling, the sounds of the dog filled the canyon. As my dad turned a corner, he saw those red eyes retreat back into the cave. They emerged from the small canyon and stopped briefly to catch their breath. 
the sounds of Sarge barking and growling echoing down the canyon. Tony was crying now, his face awash with pain. His arm, he said, he thinks he broke it. Zach, well, he was silent. My dad asked Tony if he could make it home. Tony responded he sure the hell wasn't staying anywhere near whatever that was. Suddenly a shrill cry came from the canyon. It was a dog in pain. Sarge, my dad cried, but Tony and Zach had started running down the trail. Sarge, my dad screamed again, tears welling in his eyes. There was no response. It was quiet. Sarge, come. Still, nothing. Suddenly my dad thinks he hears something. He looks up to the canyon entrance. Footfall? No. It seemed like drums. My dad sits there in confusion. Drums? What the hell? Um, is he losing his mind? The drums are getting louder. Is this in his mind? Where is Sarge? He can't leave him. My dad sees Zach leading back up to the trail. Look, we have to go. The drums are louder now, and he can hear faint chanting. Zach grabs my dad and jerks him to his feet. D don't, don't you hear that? He screams and shakes my dad. We have to run. My dad is woken from his grief as fear washes over him again. He runs down the trail with Zach. Tony is awaiting at the edge of the ario waiting for them. The wash is now running about six inches deep. They notice for the first time that a large thunderhead has developed to the south. A huge large black storm dominating the southern horizon. Lightning flashing in the distance. A new source of danger crosses my dad's mind. Flash floods. He tells Tony and Zach they need to cross the Ario as fast as possible. If it is flash floods, they will be stuck on the side with a basalt ridge with whatever that thing was. They make their way was down carefully and slowly. Tony is having a hard time because of his injured arm. They can now hear thunder rolling across the air, and the wind has increased. My dad is keeping a close eye on the creek, which has only risen a couple of more inches. They make all the way down and across the creek. The place where they crossed is only 30 yards or so ahead, so they scrabble their way towards it. The water is rising now at an alarming rate. They are going as fast as their legs will carry them. They're exhausted but keep pushing on. Suddenly, my dad, who is bringing up the rear, hears loud splashing and panting coming from behind him. His heart drops. It followed them. It's getting closer. He closes his eyes, bracing for impact. He feels something wet lick the back of his swinging hand. He turns, bracing for impact, and sees Sarge. Joy engulfs my dad. He bends down and gives Sarge a quick hug as dogs run past and the dog bound after Tony and Zack as they climbed out of the audio. My dad runs and begins to climb. When he's almost to the top, he hears crashing and loud snapping coming from the audio. Making it to the top, he sees a wave of brown debris filled water crash through the wash. He falls to his butt and watches as the flash flood fills the little canyon. Tony and Zack are lying on the ground, panting and gasping for air. My dad tries to catch his breath. He feels dizzy. He feels tears welling up and Sarge comes and licks his face whining. My dad sees that Sarge is covered with blood. He looks over the dog and finds several slash wounds on his back and snout. His ear is also torn. They don't look deep but he can't be sure. Zack is the first to speak. He asks what it was and no one responds. Tony's arm is beginning to swell pretty badly and it's only a few hours till dusk. They are all thirsty and realise in their panic that they left their packs in the small canyon, along with their canteens. They are no longer in a hurry. They are exhausted. They drink some rainwater that is pulled in one of the large sandstone boulders. They figure whatever that thing was, it's not going to be getting across the Ario for a few hours. So they slowly make their way back to Concho as the thunderhead to the south continues to drench the landscape. The three boys and Sarge make it home around eight. The sun has set and my grandparents and great uncle and aunt are worried sick. They are relieved and angry until they see the condition of the trio and the dog. The boys tell them their horrendous tale and Tori's parents rush Tony to the nearest doctor in Holbrook. That night my dad sleeps with Sarge at the end of his bed. Despite his extreme exhaustion, 
he is plagued with nightmares. One is especially terrifying, where he sees the red eyes looking in through his window. When he wakes though, in the morning his curtains are closed. The rains continued for two or three days. The boys don't leave their homes, still terrified of what happened. My grandpa and great uncle are convinced that what the boys encountered was a mountain lion, but they are intrigued by the story of the Indian burial cave. A few days later when the weather is clear, they tell the boys they want to see this cave. They make the journey faster this time, use my great uncle Willie's jeep. My grandpa and great uncle also bring along a couple of shotguns and rifles in case the lion is still in the cave. The boys show them the ario, which has been filled with new boulders and broken trees from the flash flooding. They find the trail and start making their way up, my grandpa on the front and great uncle taking the rear. They find the boys packs caught in cedar bush. They have been shredded and are in tatters. My grandpa figures they must have been caught by another flood and ended up in the trees. They finally make it to the little hidden canyon, which has been blocked by a juniper that washed down during the rain. My grandpa and great uncle get the log out of the way and they go down up the canyon to the Indian staircase. When they look up though, they can make out the darkness of the cave. The water washed away all signs of the boy's previous passage. My grandpa figures maybe at this time of day the cave is more illuminated, so he and my great uncle climb up to the and handholds to the top. The boys wait at the bottom, having no desire to go back up there. It's only my dad and Zach. Tony, with his broken arm, stayed home. My grandpa calls down for them to climb up. They do as they're told and climb. When my dad reaches the top, he is stunned. The cave is gone. It's only a 20 foot rock alcove next to a black basalt cliff covered with petroglyphs. He's confused, looking around wordlessly. He goes over to the walls looking for cracks or seams and sees nothing. My grandpa and great uncle question the boys. Were they making up stories? Um, no, they weren't. Something attacked Sarge and the boys hadn't made up being that frightened. They conclude that the boys must have forgotten where their cave was. The dads aren't mad, it's a neat area, maybe some other weekend they will look for the cave again. My dad and Zach know that this is where the cave was, there's no doubt in their minds. They found their packs and even passed by the UFO petroglyph, but they can't convince the adults, so they make their way into the jeep that is parked on the far bank of the Ario. As they load up, sun sinking low in the western sky. My dad looks back at the black abasal ridge, wondering if maybe it was all just a dream. Something in the shadow of a cliff catches his eye. He squints against the sun and sees two red shining eyes looking back at him. His blood goes cold. He turns around as the jeep pulls away. My grandparents only stayed in Concho for another few months. As soon as my grandpa finished the highway project, he got a job offer in the US Virgin Islands. My dad said after the encounter, he had nightmares every night and would swear at night he'd see red eyes at night outside of the house, until they finally moved from Concho. My dad never had a nightmare about the eyes again, but it wasn't the last encounter with the red-eyed creature. He would see it again when he was an adult, but that is the story for another time. I want to thank you all for listening, as always if you enjoy then please be sure to leave a like and a comment. I plan to start putting longer videos out again soon but I want to try get back into the swing of things again. So as always, have a pleasant evening and I'll catch you all in the next one. Thank you.